After taking her first swimming lesson at just 10 months old, my guest tonight would eventually earn a place in the pantheon of Olympic greats. Natalie Ann Coughlin used her strength, determination, and technique to become one of the most decorated swimmers the sport has ever known. She's a three-time NCAA Swimmer of the Year, the first woman to break the one-minute mark in the 100-meter backstroke, and is tied for the most Olympic medals all time by a female swimmer with 12. But before she won 60 total medals in international competitions, did you know she was disqualified from her first meet for being too slow, went to prom with wet hair, and would often swim over 60 miles a week. Tonight, we'll learn what makes this undeniable icon who she is, a woman who once said, without goals, training has no direction. Please welcome Olympic great, Natalie Coughlin. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you, have a seat. All right, so in the world of swimming now, we've had Michael Phelps on this show, and we've now had you on this show. I said to Michael Phelps that he moves fast in the water, but he walked out the slowest of anyone. <laughs> you even beat him, and you have five-inch heels on. Thank you, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I'm a speed walker. You were uh, born to great parents. I mean, as it seems like life in Northern California and Vallejo was really pretty great for you and your sister. It was pretty great. Um, you know, like we, my parents did a really good job of working really hard and everything they did was for us. And they did a really good job of teaching us how um, setting goals, how important that was. They, they worked really, really hard to put us through good school and make sure that we, we had direction. And, um, you know, I'll be forever grateful for that. Your dad, Jim, was a police sergeant, yes. which uh, begs the question, was he a tough love guy or like an I love you kind of a dad? It's pretty funny because growing up, both my parents were so strict, like so, so strict. Um, you know, uh, we come from a Catholic family, like pretty conservative. But yeah, I was uh, very much a tomboy as a kid. And so having a cop as a dad was awesome because he and I would um, spar. His, his sport was martial arts. And so, you know, he would teach me moves. And so I know self-defense. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, I wasn't gonna, me I wasn't gonna mess with you anyway. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I loved it so much, and he competed um, actually. And I, I really wanted to do martial arts, but he didn't want his, you know, little girl to get her like front teeth knocked out like he did. <laughs> right. So I, I could, I could see why he didn't let me. But he, he taught me all the basics. Your mom, Zenny, was a paralegal. Correct, and still is. And still is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I keep forgetting how young everybody is. <laughs> it walks out here now. But what did your mom teach you as, <laughs> as a young girl? Um, I think I get my feistiness from my mom. Um, you know, she is very sweet and very, very nice and um, very social. But when you kind of peel back the layers, you see how feisty she is, especially after like a glass of wine. <laughs> you, right, yeah. you see like the competitiveness come out. And so um, even though my mom never did sports, um, I think I get my competitive my competitiveness from both parents. Um, you, she's just really, you know, I get my stubbornness from her. Um, I get a, a lot of things from her, which, you know, when you're growing up as a girl, you don't want to hear that you're turning into your mom, but in many ways I have. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. It, it, I, I, I get the sense that you are just competitive, like right out of the womb. You, you're ready. <laughs> doesn't matter what the competition is. It might not even be a competition, but you want to come in first. No, I was extremely competitive. Um, I was never, when I was younger, I wasn't necessarily good at any sport that I did. I just wanted to beat the person next to me. So it didn't matter what it was. I talked to your sister. She said, you know, she just made even board games unfun. <laughs> No, it's true. And actually, as I got older, I learned how socially unacceptable that behavior is. So I learned how to, you know, tone it down in my social life and just apply it to sport. I read where you joined a swim club, the Benicia. Am yes. I saying that right? Benicia Blue, Blue Dolphins. Blue Dolphins. Yes. At six. Yes, at six. What, what did that entail? I mean, I've had two six-year-olds at different points in their life, and I don't know that I could 
trick them into going to swim practice at the yeah, age of six. It's tough. Well, you know, like like I you said earlier, and like I said, I was competitive, so I wanted to be good at whatever I did. And so um, when I was really young, my parents got me into dance, like tap dance and stuff, and they realized I was too much of a tomboy and I didn't want anything to do with that. And then I did gymnastics for a little bit, and I was kind of chubby and uncoordinated and... Um, I wanted to be good at that, but I wasn't. And then we started swimming when we moved towns from Benicia to Vallejo. And um, I joined the Benicia Blue Dolphins. And that was the first time where I was more natural. Um, I wouldn't call myself good by any standard, um, but I was much more natural in the water than I was on land. Anybody who has a child or who has done swimming on their own realizes that the dedication it takes to be a great swimmer with the laps and the... Yeah, I mean, swimming's tough because unlike many other sports, we don't have seasons. Our season is from September to August. So, <laughs> you know, you do the math, that's 12 months out of the year. Right. Um, so it's, it's tough. It's really tough. And as a kid, for swimming, you have to train before school and after school. It's doubles every day. And in Northern California, that's probably the coldest climate that swims outdoors year-round. So, you know, in the middle of January it could be 36 degrees and hailing and you're still swimming and put that on top of just the hormones of growing up and the the stress of school and trying to balance your social life it, it's it's tough it's really tough when did you first really start swimming um, when I was six years old was uh, when the uh, Seoul Olympics was going on so 1988 and I remember watching those Olympic Games and watching you know Janet Evans and Matt Biondi and all these like great swimmers and everyone on my team was like oh so and so is going to go to the Olympics someday I'm going to go to the Olympics someday you're going to go to the Olympics someday and you have no idea at six or ten or even you know 13 really what it takes but you know in swimming that's the that's the ultimate goal and so that's when the Olympics were kind of just a glimmer in my mind and you know because of my parents I learned that you just have to work your butt off to get there. I always I always wondered what were you thinking while you're staring at that black line. Yeah, no, for sure. There's there's a saying in swimming that it's just you in the back black line, and when the black line starts talking back, that's when you're in trouble. Um, but when I was younger, it was just passing the time, like is anything to pass the time. So you're singing a song in your head, you're thinking about whatever school project you're working on, you're really just kind of wasting your time because you're not focused on what you're doing. And the older I got, the more I realized that you just really, really have to focus your thoughts. And that's tough. Um, that's a lot of time in your own thoughts. And so that allows you a lot of time to be introspective and to really think about you know, your goals and what you want to achieve. and um, you know, it, it's tough. It's a grind, but it, it made me it made me really tough. Age 13, you start with this Terrapin Swim Club. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of good with this. Yes. And there's a lot of not so good with this. Right. Yeah, so um, it was the first time that I really had a lot of focus in, in swimming. Because um, before, my coach, he kind of, you know, he was a good coach, um, but he wasn't a great coach. And um, it wasn't that serious. And in many ways, I was good, you know. Um, I was serious But you needed enough. more, right? I mean, you, you, somebody knew. You knew, your mom yeah. knew, some other teammates knew. You know, you needed more yeah. push. Yeah, I mean, I was very serious on my own. I just needed the people around me to be more serious and the coaches to be more serious. And so I really took it to the next level. And so in that year, I went to, and I first qualified for junior nationals and then nationals and I final nationals. So I really had a big um, explosive breakout year. Um, so that was really good. And for many years, it was good. Um, and then and then it wasn't. <laughs> right, and, and I know this coach, mm -hmm. Ray Mitchell, was extra hard on you. Yeah, I was on the path of my first Olympic team. So the 2000 Olympic trials were coming up. I was- Everything's kind of gearing toward the 2000 exactly, Olympics. Exactly, um, You know, when I was 16, I, I broke the American record in the 100 backstroke. Um, and I won US Open and 200 Butterfly, and I was doing all these different events, and I was kind of dubbed like the next big thing in, in swimming um, for, for, for women swimmers. Um, I was on the path to making my first Olympic team. And because of training, overtraining, and 
you know, really pushing myself to the limit um, and ignoring the pains in my body, I ended up tearing my labrum in my left shoulder. And so I remember the practice I did it in too, because my shoulders went numb, which wasn't that unusual at the time because I had such a big volume program. Um, and I pushed through and then in the middle of the night, that night I woke up with just the worst pain and then I couldn't even lift my arm. And so I struggled so much because I was really injured. I couldn't train the way I needed to train. And then on top of that, I had this coach that I, I, he saw me as, in many ways, as um, validating to his career, I think. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. For as great as you were, I feel like the coach recognized it and he thought, okay, here's my ticket to greatness. Yeah. I'm going to make her work harder than everybody else, almost unrealistically hard. And yeah. this is going to be my chance to be the great the great coach. Yeah, it was it was really tough because I was having a hard enough time as it was, and then he was just piling on to me, just saying how I was an emotional basket case, and just really, he was really emotionally abusive and, and just really tore me down and tore me down when I didn't need to be torn down. I was very strong on my own, and so it's not like I needed an extra push or I needed an extra this or that. He was just straight up abusive. Um, For you specifically? Or I know he'd walk by other swimmers and say like, jiggle, 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 yeah, like you're too fat. That, that, w that was tough. That was really tough. Like, it, it, it's just so ridiculous. You can't do this. And um, I don't think you, you couldn't get away with that now. No, there's no way. You, you, like the parents would be, you know, losing their mind if they heard that while their their daughter, their 15 year old daughter, is ordering a deli sandwich and gets mayonnaise on it, that the coach says jiggle, jiggle, jiggle. You know. Um, I mean, there were teammates of yours that developed eating disorders yeah, because of this. Yeah, yeah, no, it was tough. It was really tough. What um, are your parents who were obviously nurturing, and your yeah. dad's, I'm sure, really protective? What yeah. What are your parents saying? I, I I kept it away from them in many ways. Um, you know, I was always very stubborn and very strong-willed and very independent. And so, you know, I just took it up on myself. I, I didn't really share it with them. And I just, you know, grinned and bared it. And so then that leads to the easy question, is this even fun anymore? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to quit so badly, like so badly. I really hated, hated swimming and I hated the daily grind because it was five hours of just pure hell every day. The only reason I kept going was because I knew that I would get a scholarship wherever I wanted to go. So I saw swimming as a springboard to a degree somewhere and to pay for school somewhere. So even though I saw my Olympic dreams fading away, I knew I had college swimming to look forward to. So that's really what kept me in the pool that senior year from 1999 to 2000. So we were building toward the 2000 Olympics and mm -hmm. this is kind of your immediate goal. I, mm -hmm. I know you're a goal setter and this is the obvious attraction at the end of, of all this grueling work but you've got the shoulder that's not cooperating, you've got a torn labrum, and you're trying, instead of surgery, mm -hmm. trying to train through it. Right. So if you can, just build us toward the 2000 Olympics and the trials and, and where you are in your young career at that point. It was pretty tough. So I qualified for Olympic trials in every event, um, which uh, I don't think anyone had done up until that point. And uh, I had a really good shot in a couple different events. Um, but because I couldn't train the way that I needed to train, which at the time was much more volume based, uh, so many, many more miles and um, much more distance in the pool, I focused more on the medley. And so I scaled back my, pro my program entirely to focus just on the 200 I am going to the Olympic trials. Uh, fast forward to, I'm in the finals of the 200 uh, medley and I was in, I think, lane two, um, one of the outside lanes. Um, and I had a decent race. And I remember coming home in freestyle. And so I breathed to my left when I raced. And so I was looking down at the pool, the, the six lanes to the left of me. And the water was really murky back then, um, probably because we didn't get the TV coverage <laughs> right. that we have now. So it's not crystal clear. Right. Um, With underwater cameras. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. So the water was kind of cloudy. And so I only saw one person in front of me. And to qualify for the Olympic Games, you have to get first or second. Um, and so I thought I was in second. And I was like, 
holy shit, I'm going to do this. Right. Like, this is, I'm going to do it. And then all of a sudden I hit the wall and I look at the scoreboard and I was fourth. And I was like, wah, wah. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. That's it. That's it. Was that hard to be that close to getting to the Olympics and coming up short? <sighs> Where I was emotionally, I was so drained and in many, many ways. I was bummed and I didn't, I didn't watch the 2000 Olympics that closely. Um, but I was, you know, that was my first month of, uh, of freshman year in, in school. So I was, I was busy with the social life and, and having fun and enjoying it. What did Coach Mitchell say when, when you didn't qualify for the Olympics, let's say on his watch? Oh my God. To tell you the truth, I don't even remember. I, Do you feel I, like you maybe blocked that out? I completely out? blacked it out because I, I, I have a really good memory. Uh, my parents are always like, how do you remember that? I'm like, because I was there. And I, I really don't remember much uh, of that trials. I, I, I really blocked it out of my mind. So you have this opportunity to go to really anywhere you want to go mm -hmm. collegiately. Yeah. You, end up, you end up at Cal, at Berkeley. Um, Terry McKeever mm -hmm. is your head coach. And, and I'm, I'm really anxious after what we just talked about with your previous coach to look at the other side of it. Mm -hmm. And you can tell us what kind of a coach and I guess in some ways nurturer Terry McKeever was compared to where you'd been. When I went to my recruiting trip to Cal, I met Terry and I met the girls at Cal and I really realized that this is the perfect place for me. Um, she was much more nurturing, so she uses that maternal instinct and, and, and you know, um, channels it into her swimmers. And I was an emotional wreck when I got to Cal. Um, I didn't think I would swim past my first year. Uh, when I got there through training, I just realized how fun the team environment was of college swimming. It's the first time in, um, in swimming, very much an individual sport, that you get to have that team aspect, um, that team training environment where it's Cal versus Stanford or Cal versus UCLA. Um, and so it didn't matter what I was doing personally, it just mattered how I was contributing to the team. And so mentally, that was such a relief for me. And Terry really focused on the full athlete and the journey of the athlete. And she really focused on, it's not so much about the end the end time or the end goal. It's about enjoying yourself and the whole process of it. And they, they have, in essence, a broken swimmer that mm -hmm. shows up. A great very swimmer. Much. Yeah, very much but so. But physically a broken down swimmer right. who's been swimming with a torn labrum. Right. Terry's belief was anything that makes you a better athlete will ultimately make you a better swimmer. And um, so th that was so much fun. You know, it was so much fun. It was less yardage, less mileage in the pool, um, and more cross training. I got fitter, you know. Um, I got a lot stronger from weight training. Well, you And you did literally. I mean, 2001, your freshman of the year, mm -hmm. swimmer of the year. Mm -hmm. I mean, this... So you're, the, the pilot light is relit yeah. in this great Coughlin engine that's, that's driving now, I would imagine, if you're the best swimmer in NCAAs, you gotta mm -hmm. be thinking, okay, 2004. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that summer I went to world championships. It was my first world championships. It was in Fukuoka, Japan, and um, I, I won. And uh, so I really set my sights on 2004 from there on. Um, and then the next year I had, you know, another meet and then another meet. And, um, yeah, it was, it was full steam ahead towards, towards the Olympics again. Tell me about the Phillips 66 international meet in 2002? 2002. So um, the world record was one minute point sixteen. We're talking um, about the 100 meter backstroke. The 100 backstroke, sorry, yeah. Nobody had ever gone under a minute. No one had ever gone under a minute. And that girl was one of the Chinese girls that had, you know, since then tested positive for steroids. And so it was a steroid record. And um, I had hit one double O so many times, like so many times. And I had been after that record for years. And so the whole time I, I just kept saying over and over in my mind, tonight's the night, tonight's the night, you're gonna do it tonight. Like, and that was just my mantra, tonight's the night, tonight's the night. Let's see how it turned out. Women's 100 meter backstroke next on the program. It's an old world record set back in 94 by Si Yong Hee from China, one minute point one six. Natalie Coughlin with the American record, only two one thousandths back, one zero zero point one eight. 
If anybody's going to challenge her, it's in lane number five, Courtney Shealy. But let's talk about, Rowdy, how good she is at accelerating from that start up to the surface. And, and she is already a half body length ahead of everybody else in the field. Good turn there. Now watch how deep she goes. She almost disappears completely from view and then just accelerates going to the surface of the water. And there she breaks to the surface. Rowdy, she is under world record pace out in 28.86. The old world record split, 29.54. Well in front of world record pace. And she knows that this crowd cheering her on and look at this lead, Rowdy. Uh, she's starting to tire just a little bit. Her head's starting to shake, but she's got a good shot. Look at the time, 55, 56, no one, seven, eight. No one she did it. woman ever under one minute in the 100 meter backstroke and we have just seen history in the making rowdy Gaines. what an amazing swim man that gives me chills and i, I wasn't know. there i do you see how shallow it was it was like almost up to my belly button i'm not that tall so when you see that and you think about everything that you had been through mm -hmm. to that point and the tear and the coach and the yeah what does that what does that make you feel oh my gosh it's God, I look like such a baby then. That was when world records like weren't broken like very often, so that was really special. Yeah, it was crazy. It, it, it's crazy that that was only a year or two years after such a you know uh, a bad experience with missing the Olympic team. It's it's crazy how much time could change, especially when you're that young. Um, yeah, I just I remember getting a standing ovation. I remember everyone at the at the meet just coming up to me and congratulating me, and I was just so happy. But I went into that race fully confident I was going to do that do it that night. Like I said, I, I just had that mantra: tonight's the night, tonight's the night. And so, if you would contrast the the uh, confidence that I had that day versus the confidence two years prior, it's completely different people. So you're going back to school and. Yeah. Uh... You know, how are you fitting in with the rest of the team at Cal? It was tough because Cal at the time wasn't the powerhouse in swimming that they are now. Um, both men and women are just really, really strong. Um, the, a lot of the girls on the team didn't necessarily enjoy swimming um, and didn't understand why I had such high goals for myself and why on a Friday or a Saturday night I wouldn't go out with them because I knew that you had to make choices. You know, um, every choice has a consequence. And um, I knew that I wanted to make the Olympic team and I wanted to not only just be an Olympian, I wanted to be an Olympic gold medalist. You didn't get there in 2000. Now you've got your shot. So what would winning a gold mean to you? I remember um, before that Olympic Games, uh, Rowdy Gaines, you know, he's the, the color commentator. He's so good, by the way, and, and he and Dan Hicks do such a great job. He, he was saying beforehand that, you know, all these college accolades, you know, you're the world record holder, you have American records and this, that, and this, but you're not validated until you have that gold medal. I'm like, God, thanks, Rowdy. Right, yeah. <laughs> no pressure. Um, so that was kind of what was going in my head. Like the right before that race, I was like, God, I really need this gold medal. <laughs> um, and but at the same time, similarly to that 2002 race, I knew I could do it. I, I knew that if I just did what was within my ability, I would win that race. Um, so the mantra before. Uh, that race was just do what you're capable of. In 10 minutes, it's all going to be over. You're still going to be alive. If you get first, that's great. If you don't, you're, you'll still be alive. Like, life will go on. I, I do think it's interesting that because of economic difficulties in Greece, they don't finish off the, <laughs> the aquatic center. So there's, there's open sky, which is how you grew up swimming your backstroke. So let's watch and see how the 100-meter backstroke ended for Natalie. This is the final of the women's 100-meter backstroke. You see Natalie Coughlin, the world record holder. These are her first Olympics after the disappointment that happened at the trials uh, four years ago. Well, I expect Natalie to jump out early. She loves that underwater dolphin kick, and she did already about a quarter body length lead. Take the turn for home. Coughlin split 28.89, just above the world record that she owns. Right on it. Look at that. Four or five strokes over there. 
face, and she's on top of the water. This is a tremendous swim by Coughlin. Can she hang on in lane four? Because up in lane one, and it's very close, but Coughlin gets in there. She just held off Coventry, who had creeped ahead there just at the end, but Coughlin got into the wall first. You know, that moment when, when you're able to rip off, off your cap and the goggles are... Yeah. I mean... Ex describe that for us when all this hard work and now you're a gold medal winner and you've heard you know what that means to validate this great career what mm -hmm. what that was like relief it was relief more than anything I mean I was happy don't get me wrong I was really happy and I was overwhelmed in so many ways and but it was relief I, I was glad that I had my individual gold medal um, and I could move on for the next three. I had three more events at that meet to go. Um, and so I was like, I checked that box, moving on. Um, so it was just relief and then moving on. You go to the 4x200 relay, mm -hmm. and, and that, uh, that's another opportunity for you. Yeah. Uh, that's freestyle, though. Yeah. Um, what was special about that race was going into it, we knew we were going to win gold. Um, you know, me and the three other girls, we just knew that we couldn't have a, a false start and we would win gold and we wanted that world record. And that world record was the last standing East German world record of the, you know, the eighties when all those women were doping. Um, so we really wanted to destroy that record and, um, and we did, and it was, such a party, you know, it was just such a, such a party on that top podium. All of us were so happy and we erased this, you know, um, mark on swimming history and uh, it, it felt really good to be a part of that. We have these quotes on the wall, without goals, training has no direction. Mm -hmm. what, what does that quote mean to you? It means that you, you know, you could work hard in, in practice, but if you don't have a specific goal, you're kind of wasting your time. Like you could, I mean, if your goal is just to look good and get fit, like that's great. But uh, if you want to be an Olympic gold medalist, if you want to be a world record holder, if you want to, you know, just get a scholarship to D1 school, you have to have very specific goals and you have to figure out the pathway to those goals. You can't just you know, close your eyes and throw darts blindly, you know, uh, you have to have a direction. Where do you think you got that? I think it's a combination of both my parents and Terry and just my experiences, um, you know, and leading, leading into the 2000 Olympics, like if we step back, leading into the 2000 Olympics, I was going to be satisfied just being an Olympian, just calling myself an Olympian. I was going to get the Olympic rings tattooed, probably not on my bicep, but, you know, somewhere. And um, I don't have that tattoo, by the way. Um, I would have. If, if, I, if I qualified at, at, at a 17, I guarantee you I would have gotten a, a huge Olympic rings, but I don't have it. Um, but I would have been satisfied just being an Olympian. And going into the 2004 Olympic Games, uh, I wasn't looking just to be an Olympian. I wanted to be a gold medalist, and I wanted multi multiple medals. Um, so being successful in that way is setting those goals in a very specific way, not just saying, I just want to be an Olympian. You know, I, I wanted to be a gold medalist. I have to you know, be this time, and I have to train this way and have very specific direct direction. You ended that 2004 Olympics in Athens with five mm -hmm. total medals. Mm -hmm. Third American woman in history mm -hmm. to accomplish that. I mean, this, this is, you want validation. I mean, there it is. Yeah. So the question then becomes, how do you continue to stay motivated when the stamp is already there and you're already an American great? Yeah, it, it was interesting. I, uh, Terry, she was the one who really told me to do this. She was like, take three months off. I don't want to see you until December. And I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> this is great. And so I got to really enjoy the, um, you know, the glow of the Olympics. I mean, you became a celebrity. Yeah, I, I remember walking down Manhattan. Uh, I, I was walking in Manhattan and I, and I remember people stopping me on the street and I just, I couldn't believe that anyone was recognizing me because I really didn't like the attention that much. You know, I didn't like 
um, random people, you know, stopping me all the time or just like knowing who I was when I didn't know who that person is. You know, there's like this weird reciprocity thing that doesn't happen. Um, so it was just overwhelming. I was like 22 at the time. And um, yeah, but I, I, you know, I always did... I was really conscious of who I partnered with um, sponsor-wise and what photo shoots I would do. And I was really conscious of my choices throughout the years and um, have done really well in the professional side of things because of that. So the 2008 Olympics, no female, I believe I'm right, Correct. had ever defended the 100-meter backstroke gold. Correct. So here we are again, another Olympics, and you're back. Mm -hmm. uh, the expectations, the pressure, is it different because you've done it already or was it even more intense? It was more intense. Um, I had a lot of sponsor pressure. Um, so, you know, I had a lot of, a lot of companies counting on me, um, not only just to make the Olympic team, but to get gold. And so that was a lot of pressure. Because they're buying into the Natalie Coughlin image. Right. So you have to keep yourself clean, and you also have to win. I mean, this the, yeah. you're, you're basically swimming for your money. Yeah, you're you're swimming for your your, your um, to earn a living, you know. And it's crazy when you go into a race and you're like, the next sixty seconds of my life determine, you know, how I'm going to pay the bills the next few years. I just can't get over that. That you trained for four years, yeah, intensely yeah. at the end of this long stretch since you were six. Yeah. And in the next 60 seconds, you either win or you don't. Right. And anything could happen. You know, you could be completely prepared for that moment. You could just slip off the start. Like, anything could happen. Um, yeah, it, it's it's crazy. So in, in many ways, I had a lot more pressure on me. But I had been there before. And so I was every time I felt like I was getting outside myself and kind of getting too wound up, I would bring myself back. And it's like, you know what you're doing. You've been here before. A hunter back is a hunter back is a hunter back. Hunter free is going to be the same regardless of it being the Olympic final or the first meet of the year. How aware were you of the semifinal that Kirsty Coventry I, I was very aware because um, I was giving my interviews and then um, there's a TV camera and I watch her um, and we have it yeah Kirsty Co Coventry you know I really like her just so you know she's a really nice girl okay it's not like we're arch enemies or so anything. you've already <laughs> you've already had your heat yeah now she's in her heat yeah and here's what she did yeah the second semifinal sees Zimbabwe's Kirsty Coventry, uh, who won three medals in Athens in the pool, including silver in this event, the 100-meter backstroke. Kirsty Coventry does not let up, reaches for the wall, and touches in 58.77 seconds, shattering Natalie Coughlin's world record. It appears it'll be a Coventry-Coughlin duel for gold. So that sets it up perfectly. I mean, she yeah. just swam a world record time yeah. in your event right? in the 100-meter backstroke. It, it does, does that intimidate you or motivate you it, it motivated me like it, it i i was you know slightly irked but beyond that i, I was already <laughs> looking at the next night of, of racing her in the final so when you go to bed that night leading into the next day is it is it hard to sleep you know that kirsty's kind of lurking you know your chance to defend this gold medal which hadn't been done ever before I slept like a baby that night because I was just exhausted already. Um, I had swum the foreigner freestyle relay, the hunter back, the um, tunered individual medley. So um, I was I was ready for that final. And um, once again, I just had this mantra where I was like, you could do it. You know you could do this. You just have to do what you're capable of doing and just perform. Here it is. Is Coughlin in lane five. Two lengths of the pool for the Olympic medals. She has got to swim straight. She'll be there if she doesn't start riding that lane line and bumping into it like a pinball. She's got to swim straight, but right now. Off to a good start. Early on, she is. Coughlin got off to a great start. Can she hold out Coventry, who's got good closing speed? Coventry trying to catch her. Coughlin got a pretty good lead. Her stroke rotation has slowed. Is she going to have enough? 
Yes! Coughlin wins the gold, Coventry the silver, and Holzer took the bronze. You're right, Rowdy, she was fading, but she just had enough. Oh, my God. Natalie Coughlin had the finish of a lifetime. Ah. <laughs> On the podium, you cried. I did. It was really funny because I was on the top podium, and then I looked to my left, and Margaret Holzer, she's the one who got bronze, her bronze medal, and that was her first in individual medal at the Olympics, and she was known um, much more as a middle, middle distance swimmer, like a tuner backstroker, so that was just such a bonus for her to be at that Olympics in that event, and she got a, a medal, so she was overwhelmed with joy. And so I looked to her, and she's starting to tear up. And I was like, oh, God, that's, that's so cool. She's tearing up. And then all of a sudden, like, a little bit of tears started coming out of my, my eyes. And I was like, what the hell? And, <laughs> and then I started crying because I was crying. And then by the end, <laughs> and then by the end of the national anthem, I'm just sobbing uncontrollably. And, like, snot is coming out of my face. <laughs> And my eyes are like super red. And, and then we do a victory lap. And we're doing a victory lap. And I'm so embarrassed. Like so unbelievably embarrassed because like I never cry. And then I see my old assistant coach from, from Cal. He had since moved teams. But he was there. And I didn't even know he was there. And then I cried even more because he like surprised me being there. And oh my gosh, the pictures are so ugly and horrible. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it shows what an overwhelming moment that is. Here you are. So if 2004 was kind of relief, what, what, is, what is this feeling? Can you put a word to, to 2008? Just joy, like overall joy. Um, again, it was relief, like don't get me wrong. It was certainly relief, but um, just satisfaction. Like I knew I could do that and people, you know, there, there were some critics saying that I, I wasn't going to be able to defend my, my um, title and um, they were doubting me and I saw that as extra fire for, you know, for my drive and um, yeah, just overall satisfaction and joy. You won six medals overall yeah. in all of your events in yeah. 2008. Now, now you're, you own 11 medals yeah. in Olympic swimming. You end up being named the uh, American Sportswoman of the Year by the Olympic Committee. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what? I mean, that—that's—that's yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. That's beyond swimming. Yeah. That's beyond swimming. I'm I'm very grateful of uh, that meeting. Um, I'm very grateful that they had me do that. So then you take an 18th, 18 month break. Right. From swimming was that soul-searching time? Was that let's catch up on lifetime? What, what was that for you? It was a little bit of everything. Um, I knew that um, I had a deal with a lot of my sponsors that if I had a successful Beijing that I wouldn't have any requirements um, in, in uh, what was it, 2009. And so when I did have that successful Olympics, I was like, I'm going to take a year off. And then that year bled into a year and a half. Um, but I got married that year. I um, traveled. I, I did a lot of a lot of cool things. Um, I did Dance with the Stars. Um, I did a Iron lot of sides. Yeah, I was a judge on Iron Chef. And um, did you do shows where you were cooking? I, I have since. I did. I. I competed on Chopped, um, which was really fun. And uh, yeah, so I'm really into cooking. Uh, okay, so some suggested at that time that you were retiring from swimming and that bothered you. Yeah, um, it, it always bothered me because I never, uh, whenever people have suggested that I'm retiring, um, it, it's like I never said that. Why would I retire? Um, it, it, when it really bothered me was in 2012 it was you know i was going into my third olympics i'm 29 i'm married and a lot of people are like well obviously you're going to retire and then have babies like just you know matter of factly like that's what you're supposed to do and um you know my male counterparts weren't getting those same questions <laughs> right it, it, it felt sexist to you it, it's pretty sex sexist and it's unintentionally sexist i think a lot of people um, they're not trying to insult they're you. not trying to insult me and say like you belong in the kitchen you're pregnant or anything like that but um, 
it is insulting in a way when you have teammates that are older than you that are in the same spot in, in, in life and aren't getting those questions of obviously you're going to retire. Um, it's just something that female athletes, I think, uh, are asked more often. 2011, you go to the FINA World Championships and you win three gold medals. So this mm -hmm. isn't like yeah. you're just hanging on here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're still a great swimmer. Right. And now the Olympics are right around the corner, so here we mm -hmm. go again. Right. Where were you on the totem pole? Where were you? I mean, this this is one of the most decorated Olympians out of the U.S. ever. Mm -hmm. And you've got 11 medals at this point in your life. Mm -hmm. And so do you go in as kind of the veteran that everybody has to be aware of or yeah. are you you know just trying to hang on to this olympic dream um it was it was the veteran um i i went in as the veteran as um you know i wanted to qualify for you know one or two individual events i was hoping to qualify in the hunter butterfly and the hunter backstroke and um i ended up you know, missing those events, and I qualified in the 400 freestyle relay. Which is interesting for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. One, you had the best qualifying time. In the relay, I had the best qualifying In the relay. Time. Yes. Two, your coach, Terry McKeever, is now the Olympic coach. The head coach, yeah. The head coach. Mm -hmm. But even though you have the best time, you're not picked as one of right. the four that are going to swim. You know, I was ticked. I, I, I thought that I had the experience um, that a lot of the younger ones didn't. And, um, but ultimately I was left off and I was, um, you know, told, I, I was really told that, you know, this Olympics is you being a leader <laughs> and not so much swimming so much, which was, which was tough. Yeah, I, I would imagine that hurt to some degree. It did. It hurt. What this hurt? was one of your closest yeah. allies who, in essence, isn't picking you and Terry McKeever. Right. You know, she didn't pick me. And then on top of that, you know, she's saying that I'm moving into this leadership role, which, you know, she meant well when she said that. Um, but what hurt me the most more than anything was the way that people treated me um, at that at that meet. You know, they wouldn't look you in the eye. And it's like if they saw you coming down the hall, they would go the other way, just really trying to avoid you. Um, Why do you think that was? I think it's twofold. One, they either assume that you're going to freak out and they just want to, you know, not get away, not be a part of it, which is, you know, I've been on the national team for so many years and I've never done anything to freak out. <laughs> you know, I've never fre freaked out in front of anybody or lost my cool. And so um, I've never done anything to lead them to believe that. So that was, was hurtful. And then in the other ways, they, they just, they don't know what to say. And I get that. I totally get that. But they, they really treated me like I was dying of like a terminal illness. Like they were so sad for me. And I was like, you guys, it's a, it's a swim, swim meet. Um, so, you know, that was, that was the first day of that Olympics. And then I had seven more days of swimming. And so I really, you know, even though I wasn't on that night relay, I had seven more days of being the team captain and really taking care of my teammates. And I had a lot of teammates from Cal that are on that Olympic team and just friends from many, many years. And so I embraced that role of just helping other people as much as possible. Like if I could see that someone's starting to freak out, try and bring them back down, um, back down to earth and just help them in any way that I could. And um, that was tough, but I, I'm really, really glad that I was a part of that team. That relay team ended up with a bronze medal. Correct. Do you think it would have been better had Natalie Coughlin been I, It's hard in to the say pool? that. I'm going to sound like so arrogant if I said <laughs> otherwise, but um, I, I really don't know. It's hard to say. It's really hard to say. But I, I mean, I know myself. I've always been someone who has performed even better at night. Um, if I had a prelim and a final, I was always going to be better at night. I would, you know, you, you learn how to... Um, race with your experience. You know, there's a lot of experience. Um, it's, it's important w in terms of relay takeoffs, in terms of riding other people's wake, in terms of your strategy. And that's something that the younger ones don't necessarily have. Um, but that being said, everyone's going to advocate for themselves. We didn't make the Olympic team by saying, you know, being a wallflower and thinking that we're not the best. But you end up with a medal Correct. for it. Mm -hmm. So that's 12, which ties you for the most ever mm -hmm. by a female Olympic swimmer in right. U.S. history. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's... <laughs>
I, I kind of get the sense that you feel like there's still something out there for you or you may have left something on the table that, that maybe we didn't see all that you could have done. It was interesting. I, I thought I was going to be done after that Olympics, and, but I never publicly said that or, any, or anything like that. I didn't even really talk about it with my teammates or my coaches or anything. Um, I thought I was going to be done. And the way in which people treated me at that meet really wanted me to come back and I, I wanted I wanted to keep going um, for myself I didn't want to end my career on that note and I knew I could you know still compete at a very high level and still do these great things and and from 2012 to 2016 I did a lot of really great things I had amazing freestyle times I was right on my backstroke times and um, I was proving to myself that I that I could still do it and I was really challenging myself to to still do it and what did you want out of it I I wanted to make my fourth Olympic team um, which ultimately didn't happen but I was able to you know I'm not going to say end my career because I haven't officially retired, um, right. but I'm not training right now. Uh, but I, I, I was able to end, you know, I, I didn't have to end right after London uh, on that sour note. And it was a really fun four years for me. I'm going to very carefully wade into the 2015 ESPN body oh, issue. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Um, How proud are you of, of this cover here? It, I mean, that was really fun. It, it was liberating. Um, it, it's, it's one of those things where I, I was like, I don't really understand the big deal. Um, you know, I'm in a swimsuit as it is, and most of the time our swimsuits are pretty um, sheer and see-through anyways. Right. <laughs> and I'm comfortable with my body. So, um, no, the, 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 the whole crew was so so great and and you know I never even felt naked the whole time the only time I really felt naked was when I realized how cold I was without a swimsuit you would think like this that sheer little swimsuit wouldn't do anything but just a little bit of fabric on your belly like really helps yeah I was freezing the whole time we were doing that did you send it to your old coach and say jiggle 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 <laughs> Much. <laughs> okay. You've done an unbelievable job looking back, so now look forward. What's next for you? Well, I'm working on a cookbook, um, so that's really exciting. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I'm working on a cookbook, which is really exciting. Um, I have, you know, my garden, my chickens, and all that in in California, and um, so we're. I'm focusing on a few things. All, all the healthy dishes that I had have eaten throughout my career that have helped me get to all these, you know, amazing things in, in, in sport, but also the fact that they're delicious. Like I do have a glass of wine with every meal. I do cook with Bad butter girl. occasionally. Like it, it's all about, it's all about moderation. And, um, you know, you, you meet those athletes that have broccoli, chicken breast and brown rice for lunch and dinner for like seven days out of the week. And that is so boring. There's no way I could ever do that. So, I eat really great meals. Um, you know, in California, you could easily do that. There's so many great restaurants everywhere. Um, I eat great meals and I enjoy it, but I'm able to support this, this athletic, um, these athletic goals. And so uh, I want to share that through a cookbook. So I'm working on that right now. So we end this with these ridiculous questions. Oh, no. That I will now ask you. Would you rather spend the day wearing wet socks or have a popcorn kernel stuck in your teeth? A uh, popcorn kernel. No wet socks for you. No wet socks for me, yeah. Would you rather be able to talk to spirits or travel to other dimensions in your sleep? Other dimensions in my sleep. As it is, I already have like night terror, so I think I do that already. Okay. <laughs> and finally, Simplest question you've ever been asked. What makes a great swimmer? What makes a great swimmer? Uh, mental toughness. Mental toughness. And the ability to stare at that line. The ability to stare at that line for hours upon hours upon hours, day after day, 
without many breaks, without many vacations. Um, and uh, yeah, it's tough, but it's great. I, I've, I've loved every minute of it. Well, you couldn't have done it any better. <laughs> One of the most decorated U.S. Olympic athletes of all time, our now friend, Natalie Coughlin. Thank you. Thank you so much.